Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for OVA Week 2023. My name is Dr. Shamel Gamal and I am the coordinator on OVA Week 2023. Please note that this session is being recorded. OVA Week is presented by four sponsoring organizations. First, GOA ON, the Global Ocean Identification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last but not least, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational Science and Culture Organization. Goa ON was established in, 2020, in 2012. We just handled full of members. Since then, Goa ON has grown immensely. It now has over 1,000 members from 100 and, uh, 114 countries. Goa ON also consists of nine regional hubs, which span across continent and geographical regions. We will hearing from most of them through the next two sessions. If we are not a member, if you are not a member yet, you can join Goa on today by visiting goaon.org. Our week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021 when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the ocean in the high carbon dioxide world in 2022, Go on is bringing back on our week 23 to maintain momentum around our research and provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their, their latest findings. We are thrilled to present wide range of ocean acidification topics and the speakers from around all the world. During the presentation, all, all, present, all presenters uh, are in listen only mode. You are welcome to type any question into question box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. You will be monitoring incoming questions and will put them to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will begin immediately after the final presentation. For the discussion, you can also use right hand function in the toolbox of the bottom of your screen and you will call on uh, to ask the question directly. And with this, I'd like to int introduce the moderator of the session, Dr. Uh, Alex Peters, is a UCR external project specialist for OPA. Alex earned her BA in anthropology and, and international relations from and international re relations from Kutrickel College and her MS in Marine Affairs and Policy from the University of Miami Rosetta School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, where her thesis research focused on marine uh, protected areas, management effectiveness in Cuba. And Alex will be the first speaker. Hello, Alex. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, if we could have my slides shown, please. Thank you so much. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Alex, and I am coordinator of the peer-to-peer -peer program. And our session today is um, called a Transboundary Mentorship and Capacity Building for Ocean Acidification. And we'll be highlighting two early career uh, African scientists who are members of the peer-to-peer -peer program and recently received peer-to-peer -peer scholarships. So next slide, please. So what is peer-to-peer? Peer-to-Peer -peer was established in 2016, and it serves as GoOn's scientific mentorship program that matches researchers with early career or new to OA scientists to facilitate an exchange of expertise and to provide a platform for international collaborations. It's really focused on user needs at the local, regional, national, and international scales. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer, since its forming, has supported over 250 participants from more than 60 countries, and we currently we currently have 65 active members representing 52 countries. Next slide, please. 
So I just put, or thank you, Kalina is ahead of me um, with putting the links in the chat, but this is the peer-to-peer -peer website on GoOn. It's a section on the left of the GoOn website. Um, and basically how it works is peer-to-peer -peer is a one-on-one -on -one mentorship match program. So we have um, a form online to fill out if you're interested in being either a mentee or a mentor, and that's a self-initiated registration form that you can fill out. We also have a mentor profiles document on the website, which I will say does need updating, but that helps mentees rate available mentor preferences. And then the peer-to-peer -peer coordinator individually matches pairs based on a combination of needs and interests and availability as well. Um, so just some other ways to get involved because currently there is a mentorship waitlist, but there are other ways to get involved and we do hope to share those with you as well at this time. So obviously you've heard from others to become a member of Go On, and also I, especially to those in this audience, I want to encourage you to uh, join ICONIC, um, which is the International Carbon Ocean Network for Early Careers. So either joining a regional hub or a community hub such as Iconic is really um, highly encouraged if you're interested in getting more involved in this area of work. Next slide, please. So what is the purpose of the scholarship? So the scholarship is for mentor and mentees that are already matched in the program. And either the mentor or the mentee must be from an underserved region and or underrepresented community in the ocean sciences. So it's really intended to be a capacity building opportunity. So the objective, as I said, is to build the capacity of scientists who are relatively new to studying OA by enabling them to design and implement observation and research programs through collaboration with experienced OA researchers. So this is a joint activity between the mentor and mentee that they can propose. It could be going to the mentor's lab to get trained in certain technique. It could be having the men mentor coming to the mentee's lab to help them set up equipment or do field sampling, lots of options. Typically, we are at award around 5,000 US dollars. And since 2019, nearly 30 scholarships have been awarded. And I'd like to thank our partners at the Ocean Foundation who have helped manage and administer those grants. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to introduce you to our awesome mentees. Um, first, we're going to hear from Catherine. Catherine is from the Kenya Marine Fisheries Research Institute, and she is a research assistant with six years of experience in marine pollution. She holds a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Nairobi, Kenya, and has ex expertise working in multidisciplinary biogeochemistry projects and is quite knowledgeable in several areas in marine science, including sampling and analysis of water quality, total alkalinity, plankton biodiversity studies, harmful algal biotoxin monitoring, and sediment quality. And she, her mentors were Dr. Patricia Zuveri and Dr. Eric Okuku, and her project was titled Impacts of Ocean Acidification on Calcifying Phytoplankton Species, a Case Study of E. Huxley in Kenya. So soon I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to hear more from her. But first, I just want to also introduce our second mentee that will be sharing his research today, Sam Job Philemon, who's from the School of Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries Technology at University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Sam holds a BSc in Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries and a Master's in Aquatic Sciences from the University of Dar es Salaam. Currently, he is working as an assistant lecturer at the university. He started to develop an interest in OA subjects after completing his bachelor's degree and immediately got a scholarship from the Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute to pursue a master's degree by thesis research. The main topic of his master's study was investigating the variability of carbonate chemistry parameters in critical coastal habitats, such as mangroves, sea grasses, and coral reefs. His research interests are centered on carbon cycles, climate change, and its impact on marine organisms and research on the biology and ecology of marine coastal habitats. So Sam's mentor is Dr. Amrit Kumar Mishra, and his project is titled The Role of Seagrass Ecosystems in Buffering Negative Effects of OA on the Growth and Physiology of Sea Cucumbers. So at this point, uh, that's a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer program, and I'm going to turn it over to Catherine and Sam. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as Alex has introduced me, uh, 
My name is uh, Catherine Maluga. I work for Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, which is in uh, Mombasa, Kenya. Uh, I'll be implementing this project together with my uh, uh, mentor, Dr. Patricia Ziveri and uh, Dr. Eric Kuku. Uh, the uh, project is about the impact of OA on uh, classifying phytoplankton species, uh, the EX lay in Kenya. Uh, this project, uh, as Alexa said, uh, is funded by Go On Network. So I'd uh, like to begin with uh, providing you the outline of my uh, presentation. I'll go and tell you who is Kemfrey, um, the research and scope uh, and the capacity uh, in getting to my project. And then i also tell you the project background and description and also uh, the scientific capacity. So just to let you know that I haven't started the project yet, uh, experiment yet. So this just uh, introducing you what I'm going to do. So who is Kemfrey? Uh, Kemfrey is a government uh, institute that is uh, mandated to undertake research in marine and fresh environment. And uh, the idea is to provide scientific data information uh, that uh, would uh, yeah, we advise on blue economy development, uh, sustainable the exploitation of resources, uh, fisher resources and aquatic resources. And the end goal is to contribute to the national strategy of food security, poverty elevation, clean environment, and also uh, employment creation. So on our research scope and capacity, uh, Kimfrey has four directorates. There is ocean and coastal system and blue economy, we have uh, freshwater systems, we do have aquaculture research, and also socioeconomic research. So in learn with the research, we do have a, a fully equipped maritime uh, infrastructure. We have the Arvim Tafiti, and we have the uh, motorized uh, vessels, and we also have uh, uh, fully equipped uh, uh, diving gear for the researchers who are conducting research in the coral and seagrass environment. And also in terms of laboratory services, we do have a uh, uh, fully kit laboratory. Uh, we have biological laboratories, we have the OHA labs and uh, among others. Okay, let me move on. And then we do have the offshore laboratory on the Arvim Tafiti when uh, uh, researchers goes, go for uh, long uh, cruises. So before I introduce the work, uh, I'd just like to let you know that uh, Kemfri has been involved in uh, OA uh, field monitoring and reporting on SDG, SDG indicator 14.31. And also we have conducted a number of uh, laboratory essays where we have exposed uh, tea palustries, shrimps, sea cucumbers, and a tamia cyst to varying pH levels and we determine their growth, performance, and also the energy reserves. So that's what we've done so far on the, in terms of uh, OA research. So as I introduce uh, the project background, we know that the CO2 is a critical factor in the regulation of uh, global climate through the impacts on the Earth's radiation budget, the temperature, meteorology, and also the hydrology. So human activities uh, such as fossil fuel combustion, uh, deforestation, pollution, and changing land use have uh, caused a 40% increase in the atmospheric CO2 concentration since the pre-industrial era, I mean, sorry for that. So this, alongside with other greenhouse gases, has caused a global uh, average temperature to rise by 0.6 degrees centigrade over the past century. So it's, it's now that the future projection indicate that the sea surface temperatures in some ocean areas we rise uh, at least one to four degrees centigrade by the end of 21st century. So this will be will result to, to significant uh, impacts on the marine ecosystems and uh, including phytoplankton. And uh, therefore, uh, that informed my 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 research uh, topic. 
So uh, this project will involve phytoplanktons, and we we all know that they are microscopic algae that provide uh, seafood, sea for sea creatures, food for sea creatures. And the two main classes we have the dinoflagellates and the diatoms. So coccolithophores are the unique phytoplanktons uh, that are able to calcify, and then. Uh, their role or the, the, the main role is in primary production uh, through uh, their contribution to 1 to 10 percent of the total marine uh, uh, primary production. In the addition to it, in the assimilation also of organic carbon from the surrounding environment. So uh, previous studies uh, or laboratory experiments have been conducted on uh, OA on coccolithophores. And uh, primarily here I focus on Eugsley and they demonstrated uh, negative effects on the elevated CO2 on uh, carbonate production and calcification. Uh, so, and also they are sensitive to change in temperature. So this project uh, will investigate the possibilities of using coccolithophores as indicators of OA and temperature changes in uh, the tropical reefs of uh, Kuruitu, which is in south coast of uh, Kenya. This is a locally managed area where the, the locals are restoring corals uh, in that area. So uh, this will be achieved, the, the project will be achieved through the assessment of calcification process, uh, the abundance and growth of the eugs lay, and are the present and projected uh, CO2 uh, induced CO2. Uh, acidification. So the project is uh, will be done into two components. We will have the field observation and also the laboratory experiment. So for the field observations, uh, we will uh, use the HOBO pH and temperature data logger. Uh, this equipment will be deployed for one month to provide uh, control levels for the lab pH. So after that, uh, we we going to the second phase of it, and that will be for the laboratory experiments, whereby the coccolithophores will be grown in filtered uh, natural seawater, and then their growth will be monitored through subsampling and enumeration, and then the endpoints uh, will be determined uh, will be mortalities, abundance, and their growth. Thereafter, these they will be uh, exposed to CO2, and then the CO2 gas will be basically bubbled through conical flasks. They're then monitored uh, yeah, in, the, in the lab uh, through use of the aqua medic pH computers and the Mvil uh, ventil system in preset uh, controls. Whereby there be three treatment used. We have a 0.2, 0.4, and 0.6. Uh, in the process, we have the daily physiochemical parameters will be taken of uh, pH, uh, temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, thereafter, analysis to be done. And uh, the beauty of this work is uh, on capacity building. So four interns and uh, two masters students will be used in carrying out the, the whole project. And then the results will be shared through the OA uh, information uh, exchange uh, for the broader uh, professionals to, to see what was our findings. And then if someone would be interested with the data, a uh, formal request will be done through the peer-to-peer -peer network and the data will be avail available to them. And also uh, there'll be a technical report uh, through Kempfri website and also we'll have a manuscript for the greater audience. So this is my project that is it to start so uh if anyone have something to to help me or to to enable the project uh uh, uh success uh, be a success uh please also share me what your experiences are on the uh oa on photoplanktons thank you so much and that's what i'll be doing thank you alex Thank you so much. So Sam, if you want to go next, feel free to go ahead and share your screen.
Head bank salads. Alex, is it okay? Yes, looks great. Okay. So my name is Samson Job uh, from the from the School of Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries Technology. Uh, under the under the mentorship of Dr. Amrit Mishra Kumar from Tropota, James Cook University from Australia. Uh, today I'll be presenting the outcome one <clears throat> of our research of our project, which is uh, the, just to assess the current state of knowledge of the effect of ocean acidification and on sea cucumbers. And uh, so I begin uh, with an overview, sea cucumbers and ocean acidification. And to begin, the sea cucumbers belong to the Throidia group. Uh, these Organism possesses a uh, tough and uh, an allocated body. There are around uh, 1,200 known species of sea cucumbers and 58 are uh, harvested worldwide for different uses, such as food. So, sea cucumbers are deposit feeders, and this is advantageous to organisms which are like coris, which are. <clears throat> Prone to ocean acidification because when they are uh, from their poop, does elevate the total salinity, the seawater, especially in those areas where the water exchange is minimal, like lagoons and <clears throat> etc. So, owing to that, these creatures are both economical and ecologically important. Um, so. So far, these creatures have exploited, and there are some other <clears throat> factors that make them more prone, even apart from them being prone to climate change and other things. They are from the wild, just they are already <clears throat> threatened, like they have slow growth rate, and some are uh, spawned annually, but majority of it are. Uh, are currently in the state of uh, threatened or endangered, and some are about to extinct. So apart from the, those threats, financial threats, the climate change and mostly ocean acidification and ocean warming <clears throat> are also threats to these organisms. But surprisingly, there are a few studies uh, concerning the effect of ocean acidification and sea cucumbers. And the assumption is that uh, maybe <clears throat> because of their property, that the, the global audience maybe thinks that because they can elevate the total current, so probably they may also, they may also have a mechanism to buffer themselves against ocean acidification. So ocean acidification is the progressive uh, Decrease of ocean pH due to uh, these anthropogenic carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this I mean, phenomena is projected to affect uh, divers of marine organisms, being calcifying organisms. And our interest is also centered on sea cucumbers. And we are going to look if uh, <clears throat> that fact that the, the the ability to elevate the seawater pH, uh, I mean total salinity, is also maybe a reason or can <clears throat> help them or to buffer themselves against ocean acidification. So the aim of this work, the outcome one, <clears throat> which I'm presenting right now, is just to get the overview or the current state of knowledge about the effect of ocean acidification see cucumber before <clears throat> setting up an experiment. So <clears throat> this was achieved by reviewing the articles published up to 2013, 2023, for the effect of ocean artificial sea cucumbers. So the, <clears throat> the web, of, web of science approach was used in the keywords, around the nine keywords were used, and the search was limited to Indian Ocean region. So from the web of science, we got around 1,805 articles and 
apart from those 1,800 plus articles. So I did uh, <clears throat> the first screening where was, I had to read all the abstracts from all those articles and then all the abstracts that contained at least uh, pH or CK, pH and CK number. And then I went further to screen up to uh, regional coverage that is in India, Indian Ocean and it has to be experimental study or in situ, but it has to look uh, um, on the effect of ocean acidification and sea cucumber. So I only got six articles. So today I'll be presenting the synthesis of the current knowledge of the effect of ocean acidification, these sea cucumbers from the Indian Ocean region. So just the overview of the findings. Around four species have been studied uh, out of this, all these four species comes from those 58 commercially important species. So we have around 50, 54 species and studied. And <clears throat> among all these are, are A. japonicus, the studied one, and Orothuria scab and Orothuria parva, and then there is Herman. So <clears throat> from the countries, uh, China, then Japan, Madagascar, and Australia, but the first publication was reached in 2009 by Morita, and then there was a gap up to 2014, and then 2017. Then the last one was on 2021. <clears throat> so some of the findings uh, there are some other there are some of the process that are not affected by ocean acidification, and like predator. Uh, predator defense. So these are they are they are still able even even in, in low pH they can still uh, emit or <coughs> eject these covariant tubes, but also the some of the gonad gonad indices and calcareous rings. So what are those <coughs> issues that are affected by ocean acidification? So the spam fertility is one that the 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 percent of these palms, see cucumber palms, that are motile decreases with the <clears throat> decrease in seawater pH. So, so this the 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 the, the picture on the left hand side uh, shows that uh, from the ambient pH, this the amount of of sperm that are approaching the neck. From the ambient pH and then from the low the low pH. So the lowest pH from this study was 7.6. So <clears throat> considering that these organisms are broadcast spawners and they release eggs to the sea, that means they are already diluted. So if they the their ability to move uh one egg also is affected, problem, it will lead to it 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 is going to be a big threat to them. So the fertilization success is also affected. The, the, there has been reported the 10% decrease in fertilization success per pH unit decrease. <clears throat> uh, so the growth and energy balance. So the growth rate has been also found to decrease with the decrease in pH as well as the energy uh, partition. So when they are stressed, the energy instead of going to 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 reproductive maybe organ growth, they are directed to other parts just to maintain these mechanisms instead of it being used for growth and other things. So that's why they end up decreasing as the pH seawater pH decrease. Uh, enzymatic activities also facilitating the biomineralization capacity of by this sea cucumbers is also going to be affected, has also been reported to be affected, but also the uh, immune processes, these enzymes that are responsible for many processes are also affected by, this, by, by the decrease in ocean pH. So what is the key message? So the key message from <clears throat> this outcome one is that uh, 
sea cucumber are both resilient and vulnerable, but also few, few, few species have been studied in the Indian Ocean region. But, uh, the response of these organism is species specific and hence it's called for more study to study other species. But also out of all these six, there are no animal distressor study that maybe has tried to, to combine these, <clears throat> maybe all others, I, I mean, climate change stressors such as deoxygenation, ocean warming with ocean acidification and see if they work in tandem, how will they affect these yeah, organisms? So I would like to acknowledge the Global Ocean Acidification Observation Network for their wonderful program which was funded by the Ocean Foundation and the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, the Trope Water, where my mentor is working currently in the, James, in the James Cook University. And that's where we are looking forward to conduct our, the second part of this project, which is now to set up an experiment and see how will these seagrasses now, the role of seagrasses uh, in, in, in in controlling or maybe these effects that have been been studied already, the effect of ocean acidification on sea cucumber. The Swire Institute, uh, this is where my mentor was working when we got this grant. And thanks, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, really interesting to learn more about both of your research and what you've done with the peer-to-peer -peer program. So I think we have some time for questions. Is that, I think we would go into a question session now if anyone has any questions. Looks like there's a question in the chat from Roshan. Let's see. So his question is for Sam. Are you using spectrophotometric method for pH? Is Roshan's question. Uh, thanks, uh, Roshan, for your question. But as I said, this is just, uh, this was the review, uh, the work that's intended just to review and get uh, an overview of the current state of knowledge of the effect of ocean acidification on sea cucumber. So that's we picked up an experiment. We haven't decided yet what method we'll be using to, <clears throat> to measure the, the pH when we, we, when we will be setting our experiments. Yes. So this, we didn't, we didn't go to the field. This was just a, a review, review of the current state of knowledge. Thanks. And just to follow up on that, he was also wondering if you're using any pH sensor. Sure, we will, have, we will use the pH sensors, yes. We will use pH sensors to, to monitor the pH, but also even pressure pressure of carbon dioxide when you're setting our experiments. Yes. Thank you. Um, Catherine, it looks like we have a question from uh, Loya wondering if there are any challenges or limitations of using the hobo loggers and how do you calibrate them? All right, so thank you, Ria, for your question. So the experiment is there to begin, as I mentioned earlier. So I'll, I'll update you maybe i can share my email you can share your email address so that i'll tell you what would happen with our ph logger thank you great um looks like for sam there's another question about um why is the underlying physiology for the calcareous ring to not be impacted by oa Okay, uh, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. So these these are uh, organisms like uh, coral reefs. 
the calcareous are parts are outside, so they are directly in contact with these with the with sea water. So when the ocean's pH goes down, so it directly affects them. But uh, as I said, they are these organism sea cucumber have tough skin, so the calcareous ring is inside. So probably that could be the reason for their them being uh the, the that that part being not uh, affected directly but it is a uh, as i said the this is the the there are only four species that have been done or studied so and then in the case of calcara strings i think it's not all so may, maybe to other species probably they may be affected so that is subject to other 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 research that will be done for other species, but so far they are not affected, and that is one of the reasons that because it is protected by the skin and then it is internal, unlike coral reefs and other calcifying organisms. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, and just a follow-up question: What is the next step for you and your organization in terms of OA and sea cucumber research activities? Okay. Thanks. So. Actually, the School of Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries is working in collaboration with Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute. So we have we have uh, establishing uh, a, a long term monitoring place. So it, it is in the Tanga Pemba seascape. So I've started monitoring the ocean acidification there from I mean these parameters, pH, uh, total salinity, and then from from. 2022 October, and we are getting the data after six months. We're receiving the data and calibrating sensors monthly, but now what's next? So after after doing after after this 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 training program, so we are looking forward now to 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 increase the maybe the 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 coverage. The, of the of the monitoring sites, but also now to move into understanding now how uh, ocean acidification is affecting these these marine organism because as the best of my knowledge, there is no any study or something or ongoing work that is assessing the effect of ocean acidification. Maybe in Tanzania, I'm not sure about the. I'm I'm sure of Kenya there are some studies or ongoing projects, but I'm not sure in Tanzania. So. I'm looking for now to establish those studies and in collaboration with other scientists. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, Catherine, I saw that you just answered uh, Rashawn's question about if you have any certified reference materials. So no, not yet is Catherine's response. Um, from Fatima, we have a comment and a question. I thank you for your efforts, but I would like to see more training and knowledge transfer between North and South. Also, could you tell us what are the bases on which you choose this country or that country to organize the training workshops? Um, what Can you be more specific about what the training workshops are? Maybe in the chat. Maybe in the meantime, while we wait, does anyone have any other questions? So, um, Fatima, did you mean perhaps which countries participants come from for the peer-to-peer -peer program? Um, if that is the question, then there's no, um, there's no limitation. Okay, so for making the mentorship. So um, there's no limitation in terms of like where you can, where you're from to sign up for peer to peer. You can be from any country, but um, we try and facilitate mentorship matches where it'll connect you with a researcher who's maybe outside of your country or outside of your institution. Um, 
And then to be eligible for the scholarship program, um, you have to already be matched in the program, but then also um, be from a underserved or underrepresented community. So that could be the list of countries um, that receive direct um, assistance in terms of aid, or, you know, we, we expanded that recently so that it could be also countries beyond just that list. Um, so, but oftentimes the mentorship component is based more on, you know, what, what the mentee is interested in or needs support on and who might be the right mentor fit for that. Do we have any other questions? Definitely want to encourage um, everyone to get involved with their regional hubs. Um, thanks, Katerina, for putting that in the chat. Um, particularly for this group, being involved in OA Africa is a great network, as well as Iconic, which we mentioned earlier. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I think we can wrap up a little bit early. Um, but thank you, Sam and Catherine, so much for your presentations. It's really great to hear more about the research that you're doing. And thank you all for coming to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for moderating this session. We would like to thank the organizers, moderators, and the speakers for a great session. And we thank you, the audience, for joining us for OAV 2023. Please don't forget to consult the website and register for the next upcoming se two sessions. If you would like to stay up to date, if you would like to stay up to date with Goa On community, consider signing up as a Goa On member at www.goaon.org. To discover more about ocean acidification research for sustainability, please scan this QR code. Thank you all and see you next session. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.